Okay, Philip Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. Today I want to talk about whether or not Robert E. Lee uh, whipped his slaves. Unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, discussion about this, which stems from a book that came out about 13 years ago. I'll get into that, but uh, first I want to show you, uh, well, yeah, first I want to point out in the upper right, uh, there's a notification bell up there. If you click on that, uh, you'll be notified whenever I have a new uh, episode released. And, uh, you know, right now we're trying to get to uh, 3 million subscribers. So if you want to click on that and help us get to that 3 million level, that'll be great. If you want to understand about Lee, I'm going to get into my narrative of, of this good Robert E. Lee's whip slaves. But one of the ways to do that is to pick up this book. The Confederacy at Flood Tide by Philip Lee. Uh, it covers uh, June of 1862 to December of 1862, when I think the Confederacy came closest to winning its independence. And Robert E. Lee was a key part of that. At the, at the beginning of that era, he had a reputation, but he really made his reputation, the reputation that lives now, or let's say lives you know, 40 years ago. Uh, for excellence as a military commander and as a gentleman and as a role model for leadership. You can buy the book from me uh, uh, for uh, $31 and uh, you'll get a signature. If you're in the United States, I will pay for postage. What you want to do, if you want to buy it with a signature, you email me at phil underscore lee, L-E-I-G-H, at me, M-E dot com, Phil, H-I-L underscore Lee, L-E-I-G-H and me dot com. It's also available on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble and as I say, all fine bookstores. You can get it through them uh, and uh, they, they won't have a signature. It's a hardcover book. Uh, so, uh, you know, give it some thought. Now let's get into this uh, question of whether or not Lee whipped slaves. Now, notwithstanding the currently popular interpretations among academic historians, there is no convincing evidence that Robert E. Lee ever whipped slaves. The argument that he ordered the flogging of three runaways in 1859, which was a couple of years before the Civil War started, took on new life after uh, Elizabeth Brown Pryor published a book called Reading the Man, colon, a portrait of Robert E. Lee through his private letters. And she wrote that in 2007. She reportedly had access to letters that uh, Lee wrote that nobody else had ever seen. Well, contrary to her implications, she provides no new evidence regarding accusations made by runaway slave Wesley Norris, which were first publicized in 1859 by two anonymous letters to the New York Tribune, and later in an 1866 article a year after the war, obtained, quote, scare quotes, from the lips of Wesley Norris, close quote, also in the New York Tribune. Now, it should be noted that the New York Tribune had a reputation uh, as an abolitionist newspaper. Uh, the uh, publisher there was uh, Horace Greeley. Now, at this time, Lee did not own any slaves. Uh, and, but after his father-in-law died in 1857, Lee became executor of the estate that included almost 200 slaves at three Virginia locations. Arlington House, which is across the Potomac River, from uh, Washington, D.C., and is presently you know, known as uh, Arlington Cemetery. Roman Coke, which was uh, another plantation down, I believe, on the James River, or down uh, southeast of uh, Richmond, and also White House Plantation uh, in the same general area. Now, the will stipulated that the slaves were to be freed. Uh, the master, uh, the father-in-law's name was George Custis, and he was a grandson by adoption of uh, George Washington. 
Now, that will that said they should be free also said that the executor, who would be Robert E. Lee, could take up to five years to release them, partly because Virginia law required that slaves could not be let loose into freedom into a condition of vagrancy. They had to have something provided for them. And the master would also be responsible for the younger and the older ones financially. Now, the properties were also in debt and needed repairs. They were also unprofitable. Finally, the will required that Lee's daughters be given legacies of $10,000 each. Now, these were the granddaughters of the man who just was deceased, custom. Now, those $10,000 legacies would require that the properties either be sold or become profitable or in some way raise cash. So what Lee decided to do was to work the properties before freeing the slaves. Since there were far more slaves than required at Arlington House, he rented some out. Now what happened at Arlington House is as George Custis aged, the slaves that were in Arlington House, which was the principal plantation, um, and it wasn't really a plantation, it, it, it was, I guess, sort of a farm that where the slaves really didn't do much except live in their cabins and grow their own vegetables and uh, you know take care of themselves they really had compared to the slaves elsewhere in the south they really had an easy life um there just wasn't that much to do at all so as it you know as events transpired lee did free all the slaves in december 1862 and thereby complying with the five-year limit even though that was right in the middle of the Civil War. Now, as might be expected, and this happened also with George Washington after he died and freed his slaves, they all expected to get freed right away. That's what they had expected. And in this case, the same thing. The slaves misunderstood that they were to be freed immediately upon the, based upon alleged conversations they had with Lee's father-in-law, George Custis, before he died. Now you can imagine a situation where, you know, the, the old man is, he, you know, he, he tells us like, you know, I'm y'all are going to be freed when I, when I die. And, you know, he knows this is going to be taken care of his executor and the details will be with the executors. He doesn't worry about it. He just tells them they're going to be free. Uh, something like that must have happened because clearly within the will, there was this five-year limit. So in response, Lee pointed to the critics that claimed that, you know, he was keeping them against the uh, terms of the will. And that revealed the four-year limit, the five-year limit. It was in the documents that had been filed with the court. Nonetheless, one of the slaves, Wesley Morris, and a few other Arlington slaves set out for Pennsylvania to live their lives as presumed free blacks. Um, all of them were caught. I think that was done in two separate episodes, but all of them were caught in return. Now, Norris, when he left, he left with his sister, Mary, and their cousin, George Parks. Now remember that name, that name George Parks is gonna come back to us as I get through this narrative. When the three were recaptured, Norris claimed that all were whipped. Notwithstanding that Lee denied the incident, author Pryor believed Norris's story. She, she died in an auto accident some years ago because she said, there were five witnesses and other particulars of the narrative, quote, ring true, close quote. In reality, there were no other witnesses. Nobody came, stood forward to collaborate Wesley Norris's story. Nobody. The five that Pryor implies were really just two anonymous 1859 letters to the Tribune and anonymous versions of the Norris 1866 Tribune article to other newspapers, presumably uh, newspapers that also had a reputation for being abolitionists. The remaining particulars that Pryor feels validate her story involve points that don't really prove any whipping, such as, you know, the location of Norris at various times. Where was he at a particular time? Well, for example, they have, no, they have nothing to do with the whipping. And the fact, for example, that Norris was recaptured and returned 
to Arlington on the date that he alleges all three were whipped, for example, that's no proof of an actual whipping. In other words, he could get the date right. Yeah, we got caught, and that's when we were dumped off at Arlington. That's the right date. Those dates match up. That doesn't mean he was whipped. Uh, Pryor, uh, the author of this book, uh, apparently says that you know that you know that's a particular that matches up. So that 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 implies that he's telling a true story. Yeah, he might be telling the true story about when he got back to Arlington, but it has nothing to do with the whipping or alleged whipping. No proof of it. In truth, there's better evidence that Lee believed slaves should be well treated. We're going to read excerpts from a letter that he wrote later that shows that it implies he had friendly, friendly relationships with the Arlington slaves. After the Civil War, Lee was required to testify before a Senate committee in February 1866. The committee wanted to get feedback on the conditions in the southern states. They were concerned whether the southern states might renew the rebellion if, for example, Great Britain decided that they would recognize it, recognize the, you know, the Confederates. Well, anyway, while he was in Washington, one of the Arlington slaves stopped by his hotel for a visit while he was out. The visitor was Amanda Parks, and she was the sister of George Parks. I told you, remember that name. George, if George had been whipped under Lee's supervision in 1859, it seems unlikely that Amanda would want to pay a respectful visit to Lee at his hotel in Washington. When Lee returned to his home in Lexington, Virginia, returning from Washington to Lexington, Virginia, where Lee lived at the time in February of 1866, he wrote Amanda as follows. Lexington, Virginia, March 9th, 1866, Amanda Parks. Amanda, I have received your letter of February 27th and regret very much that I did not see you when I was in Washington. I heard upon returning to my room Sunday night that you had been to see me and I was sorry to have missed you for I wished to learn how you were and how all the people from Arlington were getting on in the world. My interest in them is as great now as it ever was and I sincerely wish for their happiness and prosperity. He's referring to the former slaves. I do not know why you should ask if I am angry with you. I am not aware of your having done anything to give me offense, and I hope you would not say or do anything that was wrong. While you lived at Arlington, you behaved very well and were attentive and faithful to your duties. I hope you will always conduct yourself in the same manner. Wishing you health, happiness, and success in life, I am truly R. E. Lee. That is a letter to George, who was reportedly whipped with, I think it was 50 lashes, is what Wesley said. Wesley Norris said Lee used 50 lashes on the men, whereas the girl or the woman was supposedly got 39. So if George Parks, who was Amanda Parks' brother, got 50 lashes from Lee seven years earlier. It doesn't seem likely she would want to visit him in Washington, D.C. when he went there for a visit. Additionally, while he was working the properties uh, during this, uh, late, this period of, uh, as, as an executor, and before manumitting the slaves, he advised Robert Jr. how to manage the Roman coke slaves, quote, attend to them and give them every aid and comfort in your power and they will be happier, close quote. After lamenting a fire at a neighbor's place, Lee counseled, I trust you will so gain the affection of your people that they will not wish to do you harm, close quote. Earlier as a young man, after he inherited slaves from his mother when she died, Lee took one of them on duty with him to Savannah. It was an elderly personal servant who was in ill health 
and it was thought that he would do better in a warmer climate. Uh, he went with Lee to Savannah, which is far south of uh, Arlington. And eventually he, di he died while he was with Lee, while Lee was on duty in the Savannah area. In short, Pryor's book appears to be an agenda-driven smear of Robert E. Lee, disguised as a breakthrough study of previously undisclosed letters kept private by the Lee family. In an era when the New York Times wins the Pulitzer Prize for the Lincoln Project, nobody should be surprised that Pryor won the $50,000 Lincoln Prize for her book, I guess back in 2007. And again, to get a better picture of Lee, um, I recommend my book. The Confederacy at Flood Tide, which covers the ascendancy of the Confederacy, the time when it had the most, was most likely to win its independence from, the, from June of 1862 to December of 1862. It's not all about Virginia. It includes Kentucky, uh, even the Mississippi Valley, Valley and even the Trans-Mississippi. There was an advance across that entire um, line. It also includes political developments, and diplomatic developments, and uh, espionage. Um, there were a lot of things that were going right for the Confederacy during that period. They came close. So if you want to get the copy from me, it's $31. Email me, phil, P-H-I-L, underscore, Lee, L-E-I-G-H, at me.com. Okay, uh, it's uh, November 25th, Wednesday, and thank you for watching.